Great. Well, thank you, everyone who is joining us this evening. And thank you, Sarah and LLNF for hosting the webinar so that we can finally record this presentation that Sarah and I have given in a couple versions and in a couple places over the past couple of years. We are really excited to be able to give this tonight to a large audience and then be able to record it so it's available longer term. Um, so this presentation is part of what we're calling the Nantucket Climate Change Summit Winter Edition. And some of you might have been around last fall. This fall, Sarah and I launched, started Nantucket's first Climate Change Summit in September, um, where we were working to bring our local community together so that we can learn about what's happening on island with climate change and have conversation around it. There's a lot of conversation around climate change. And we wanted to create a venue where we could help bring some of the things that we know and we're learning through our work and our research to the community, but also bring the community together to talk about what they're seeing and what they're doing on their own properties or encountering, encountering in their own world. So thank you for joining us as we're kind of continuing this learning journey together this winter by having a series of these presentations. And if you are on island, you can join us for some walks out on different properties around the island to learn a little bit more about climate change on Nantucket. Um, and before we dive into what we're doing today, Sarah and I thought that we should introduce ourselves in case you haven't met us before. Um, I'm Dr. Jen Carberg. I'm the Director of Research and Partnerships for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. I've been living and working on the island for about 16 years now, I think. Um, I'm a wetland ecologist, which means on an island like Nantucket, I've become a coastal ecologist, which also means that I am very, my work is very closely tied to climate change and impacts that we're seeing on the island and how we can help mitigate them. Sarah. Thanks, Jen. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Sarah Boyce. I'm the Director of Research and Education here at the Linda Laurie Nature Foundation. Um, as Jen said, we've been kind of doing versions of this uh, work together and teaching a coastal ecology course for a couple of years now, and we thought this was a great way to kind of bring some of this information more to the public. And one of the things that I know both of our organizations are passionate about and one of the things that we work on um, is about uh, communicating with our community and thinking about how we can learn from each other and talk about climate change and so um, hopefully, you know, this tonight we'll share some new information. Um, and then also with that recording, we'll be able to share it more broadly. So you can, you are feel free once you get the recording too, to pass it along. Absolutely. Okay. I'm attempting to advance. We'll see if this works. Oh, I think it's because I was looking at the chat earlier. That's why. So <laughs> tonight we're going to dive into a presentation on what does climate change mean for Nantucket right now? Um, and we want to talk about this. It's really important because this presentation kind of roots us in all of our discussions around climate change impacts that we're seeing on island, change, just broad change that we're seeing, ways that we're adapting on island. A lot of the headlines that we see talk about places that aren't necessarily here. So this presentation today is a really great way to get a common language around what climate change is and what we're actually seeing on the island, how things are changing, what's evolving. Um, you'll see this lovely uh, QR code down here in the corner. Feel free to scan that with your phone if you have it or go to the website that's down there. One of the things that we're hoping to do is not just bring our stories and observations, but everyone's stories and observations on island together about what we're seeing that is change. And so if you go to this, there's a little survey about just what are you seeing? Is there something in a maybe a path that you've walked on every year for the last 30 years where you're seeing change on that? Is the time of when you're planting in your garden changing? Are you seeing, observing other changes around the island? And as we go through the presentation today, especially when we get to Sarah's parts about um, actual impacts on the island and changes in how things are behaving on island, timing of things. You'll see some of these examples of what we've seen and it might spark some ideas for you as well. So this flow code will come back up at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to put some of your observations in there and we're continuing to kind of gather those from the community. So today we're gonna go in and set a common language around climate change 
and then look at its impacts here on Nantucket. And Sarah and I are gonna pass kind of the presentation back and forth as we go. You'll, you'll see us move through this, um, but please, as she said, put any questions you have uh, um, in, the, in the chat box or in the Q&A if you have some bigger questions. So why did we design a climate summit, a climate change summit? If you came to this in September, you saw some of these headlines. There's a lot more of them now that I've put on here. This past year, impacts that we were seeing around the world were really sparking conversations about climate change. The impacts of climate change were making some pretty big headlines. A lot of it was temperature focused. You know, global average temperature for July of 2023 was the highest on record. Uh, and likely for a very, very many years before, um, just this January at the end of it, officially 2023 was the hottest year ever and that 2024 may be even hotter. And I will stress that we're not talking about global warming, we say climate change and, and you'll see some of the, the nuance there as we move in, but warmer global temperatures overall, average warmer um, temperatures are an impact of climate change. Colombia, usually wet nation, reels amid widespread wildfires, you know, immense changes and things that are happening on the landscape. 2024 is an inflection point for what's happening with climate crisis. Um, and this one is interesting. We'll get into it as we talk about the global heating may pass the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold this coming year. That was just, you know, in early January. Uh, we'll talk about what that is and, and why that's an important threshold for us to think about. So as we're talking about why climate change is important, what actually is it? And I know if you've seen us talk before, you've probably seen this slide before, but we really like to bring it back because it gives everyone that same language around climate change. Climate change is long-term change in the average weather patterns that define climates. This can be local, regional, global climates, and a lot of that includes temperature and precipitation primarily. There is natural, change variability within our world's climate. Climate cycles can, can work with the Earth's orbit around the sun, different energy patterns from the sun, natural cooling and warming in the ocean, variability of volcanic activity. A lot of things can naturally change what's happening with climate. When we're talking about climate change, what we're often referring to as anthropogenic climate change or changes really defined by how humans have impacted our climate very directly, and it's really linked to burning fossil fuel, aerosol release, and alteration of land from agricultural and deforestation. So what do all those things have in common? Fossil fuel burning, land alteration, it's all the release of carbon, our very favorite chemical, and somehow increases of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere drive these worldwide changes that we're seeing. So I really, really like this graph. I think it's really clear to see. We have carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere against years before today, um, where the zero year point um, is right here on your screen. And that's 1950 changes in carbon dioxide. It's around 300 parts per million carbon dioxide. And you can see the thousands of years, the centuries of atmospheric carbon that we've been able to capture through um, ice cores, soil cores, other um, data that we've been collecting around the world, we can actually see those patterns and we can see that while it has fluctuated over time, this amount of carbon dioxide, we haven't reached the levels that we are experiencing right now have never before been seen in what we can actually, the, in the reported history that we can actually gather. Um, this number that's up here, whoop, apologies just moving myself out of the way so I can see it. Um, you can see this higher number here that we're at currently is about 400 parts per million. About five years ago, we said it would be really bad if we got to 400 parts per million. Well, we've gotten there, we're at that point. We're at that point where there's enough carbon dioxide in our atmosphere that we are gonna have change that we're gonna have to adapt to. Um, now we're saying we can't get to 410. Uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide. And that's kind of the, the task, the goal, is to see how we can change local behaviors, regional behaviors, and global behaviors to control the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So I said we'd come back to this 1.5 degrees Celsius and what does it mean? This 1.5 degrees is one is 
average global temperature. So this is averaging over 30 years, what the temperature is not just in one season or one year or one snowfall or one, you know, hot, hot flash, um, but in 30 years worth of average temperature around the world averaged out. And in the Paris Accord in 2015, at the UN Climate Change Summit, many communities got together and agreed that we didn't want to pass 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures for the world, that this would have consequences, uh, that it would be really hard for us to come back to or to mitigate um, or be able to handle uh, as within our world. So this is a really great resource. I suggest if you want to check out this website, it's great. Um, but every time there's new data on global climate change, the new temperature numbers are coming together, they recreate these graphs and predict out using that information when we are most likely to pass that global average temperature that's 1.5 C above pre-industrial. So this graph was done that you're looking at right now was done in 2020 using that data, December 2020, and estimating that by January 2034, our average temperature globally um, would be in that 1.5 C. Now, just this year, this graph was recalculated and that number was backed, was bumped back. The temperatures that we had this year, that rise in warming was so much that it actually adjusted our predicted date for when we're going to hit this increase in global warming or global global temperatures. And it's predicted that 2024 will be even warmer. So we're seeing these trends where we're getting closer and closer to that over time as globally temperatures are warming. And I guess I would like to take this moment to say that this point of the presentation sounds very, very grim <laughs> as I'm talking about all of the things, all of the impacts, and Sarah and I will go into a lot of impacts, but we will also talk about a lot of change. And change itself isn't necessarily bad, but it's good to know what's happening, why it's happening, so that we can figure out the best ways that we can adapt as a community. So I just want to put that, that, that point in there. So we've, we've talked about what is climate change. Well, really broadly, here are the impacts. Climate change is that shift in um, temperature and precipitation patterns that change in, in essentially climate, local climate weather patterns. So what does it mean on the ground? Well, on Nantucket, we're used to talking quite a bit about rising sea levels, warmer waters, warmer oceans, um, acidification of our oceans, changes in, in the species that are on our shoreline, erosion, um, but it's more than just what's happening within our ocean. We're getting broader, higher temperatures and more heat waves. We're getting more extreme weather patterns. Um, so you might have more intense winter, colder winter storms, but then you're also going to have more intense summer heat as well. Um, it's less predictable, it's more variable. We're getting changing rain and snow patterns, which can have really big impacts on changes in our plant life cycles. Uh, we're getting more droughts and wildfires, which is something that was really in the news this past year and the year before. Uh, less snow cover. Um, this year actually is the, um, the least amount of ice that's covered the Great Lakes in the past 50 years or so. And that has a really big impact on what's happening with you know, local ecology as well. So these are broad impacts. But what we wanna do with this presentation today is talk about what it really looks like here on Nantucket and bring you through those broader pictures of climate change into what we're seeing on the ground. So we're gonna hit two parts of this. We're gonna hit climate change, which is those changes in temperature and seasonality of temperature variation, um, changes in the amount and timing of precipitation that we're getting, ocean warming changes in our ocean and ocean currents. That's the climate change piece. And then we're gonna talk about the actual impacts or other changes that we're seeing on the ground. So increased storminess and flooding, ocean acidification, erosion, sea level rise and flooding, groundwater, changes in what plants and wildlife are doing and changing phenology. All these are things you've probably heard pieces of before, but we're really gonna dive into what that means here on Nantucket. Thanks, Jen. All right, um, all right thanks. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the the piece that Jen has just discussed is really great because it really helps. Um, the theme I think you'll hear us say over and over again is really this commonality of language. And some of it is trying to help um, as we all 
you know, listen to the news or, you know, read reports or read the newspaper or hear talks. Um, some of it is the commonality of language, but also knowing um, the nuances and the, where the variation is. And one of the things um, that we talk about is, as Jen mentioned, you know, for a long time, we discussed climate impacts as climate, um, as global warming. Then we're talking about climate change. Um, and so these words get interchanged and then sometimes it can get, you know, like maybe not confusing, but it's, um, you know, thinking about what we're talking about. And so we also talk about warming in this case, uh, where I'm getting at is we've been talking about, you know, global averages, even national averages, but um, knowing when you're reading something or listening to something, what the frame of reference is, is also important because you'll see different numbers and it doesn't mean that any one number is wrong. It's that, um, you know, the global average versus the national average versus a state or regional average um, of something, um, you know, they're all reading different pieces of the data. So I always preface that just to say, um, you know, as we know that there is overall or overall the temperatures are rising um, and that's in, you know, Jen was just talking about that 1.5 um, degree C, but we know that um, the the actual warming is not uniform. So it's quite variable around the globe. And even, you know, this map that's on the slide or um, that's up right now is from the 2022, 2022 um, NOAA report. And we know that nationally, you can just see that where people live really changes their personal experience with warming. Um, and so just looking at this, even without knowing what the exact numbers are, you can see that the dark red areas are where temperatures are much higher um, than the historic averages. And we know that in New England in particular, um, air temperatures have warmed uh, by about 1.7 degrees Celsius since 1901. Um, and so there's a lot of really, in, I mean, from an ecological standpoint, there's a lot of really interesting research that happens in these areas in New England because it's changing more dramatically than other parts of the country. But that's also important to you know remember when we not just the data, but as a community and nationally, what people are physically experiencing themselves might be different than what we're experiencing here um, in New England and along the coast. Next. Sorry, I think I'm sorry. Um, and similarly to temperature, precipitation has been more variable. Um, and Similarly, with this map, in this case, the darker green areas are having higher precipitation than the historic averages, and the kind of tan colors are having less precipitation than historic averages. And, you know, this is actually precipitation is even more variable. Um, and so in New England or in Massachusetts, this kind of this um, uh, snippet of data is specific to Massachusetts, but we've had an, a 15% increase in precipitation. Um, between 1901 and uh, 2022. Um, and I think the really interesting thing about this change is we don't always feel that increase. So um, it's not an increase, let's say, across the whole um, year, you know, the year round cycle of precipitation. We're not just getting 15% more precipitation. Um, sometimes these precipitation are events are becoming more episodic. And with that episodic events, we're getting more rain events um, and then longer periods of dry weather. Um, and of course, any year's weather doesn't, you know, mean, you know, ch change the whole climate average. But I feel like relating what the um, what people experience to what we're seeing as the increases in precipitation, increases in temperature are kind of help us think about how we relate to each other and communicate about climate change as well. Next, please. And in addition to precipitation and air temperatures, we're of course then seeing the effects on our oceans. And so our sea surface temperatures in our region are also warming at an alarming event or um, more dramatically than other parts of the world. Um, so in this kind of close up picture, um, you can see the darker red are once again, are warming um, our higher sea surface temperature anomalies um, this is the darkest red are more than five degrees Celsius. Um, and this figure is a little bit old. It goes between 1985 and 2012, but the pattern has remained the same where the Gulf of Maine and just off Cape Cod are actually quite 
um, higher in temperature than other parts um, of the country. Um, this has to do with both the air temperatures as well as the changing of the um, ocean currents. And if you want to click next and see the, um, the broader global average. So this figure is a little bit newer. Um, this is from 20 up to goes up to 2020. But even in a global average, you see that globally the oceans are warming. Um, and there is still that very dark red in that, you know, kind of New England, off the coast of New England, um, Gulf of Maine area. Um, you might also see a dark blue area. People have asked about the, the blue areas where the water is actually colder. That's the melting um, glaciers. And so that cold water um, is really is like coming right directly into the ocean. So, um, you know, looking once again between our precipitation, our air temperatures and our water temperatures, um, our New England area is exp experiencing significant change at a faster rate than much of the other or other parts of the globe. Next, please. Um, and one thing people have talked a lot about storminess, um, and there's been some discussions about how have there been more storms, more frequent in, um, rain events. And I don't have the data on this slide, but there has been some research to show looking back at historic storms that it's not necessarily that there are more frequent, that there are more storms overall, like there's more rain events. What we're experiencing are more rain um, storms of significant note. So if you want to click the next slide, Jen, um, you know, this, everyone who has been on Nantucket is probably familiar with this um, at the Easy Street Park, the historic flood event, um, this beautiful diagram that was put in the, um, by the land bank. And these are those kind of um, storms of notes that have had significant flooding events. And the data show, um, th and this is, you know, more broadly, not just for Nantucket, that it's not that there are more storms, that there are more storms that have significant effects. And if you want to hit next again, um, and just, we know that just, um, I think this was January 12th of just last month, um, this picture from the Nantucket Current from Kit Noble, the water was um, just about up to the 2005 historic line. So are we going to need to be adding more historic lines to our flood events? Um, but, you know, these were historic storms of note that people would tell their grandchildren or remember where they were and, you know, have stories about. And these types of storms are having happening more and more frequently that this is becoming in the norm. And so, you know, as Jen was saying, we're we're starting off with all this doom and gloom. We're thinking about what are we going to have to get used to? Or what are we going to have to um, adapt ourselves to? Um, and it's these types of storms that are becoming more and more frequent. Next. Um, then, you know, Jen also mentioned in the impact um, piece is discussions about ocean acidification. And so this map, once again, these, you know, you don't need to know exactly exact numbers and what's being measured, but the this is looking at ocean acidification, particularly in the Gulf of Maine. You can see Nantucket down towards the, the bottom left a little bit. Um, a lot of these pictures are Gulf of Maine because the Gulf of Maine Research Institute has been doing a ton of work in this area. And also because it's um, seeing such dramatic change, a lot of research is going on in this area. And what we're showing is um, with the, the, once again, the red colors, red always means like bad, you know, extreme. Um, these red areas, which are a lot of them are estuaries where water is kind of the, um, the ocean is meeting um, with the land. Uh, this, these, uh, this is where there's the highest um, acidity in these areas. Um, and we're kind of really being watchful for ocean acidification in our region. If you want to click, click next. When we talk about ocean acidification, um, it's a series, basically we're looking at a series of chain reactions or chemical reactions. When there is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it is absorbed by the ocean. And it is, you know, reacting with our car the carbonate ions and pulling them out into and turning it into carbonic acid. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of glossing over this, but basically it's creating more the more carbon dioxide that's being absorbed, they're causing more acidification into the ocean. Um, it's also taking those carbonite ions away from the, you know, corals, mollusks, and other marine creature creatures that use that those carbonite ions to make their shells and their exoskeletons and the coral um, structures. And so when we, you know, especially here on Nantucket, where we're so concerned about our shell fisheries. Um, not just, you know, ecologically, economically, and commercially, and also, you know, our historically what our community, our community fishery has been about, our shellfish, 
or a lot of it has been about shellfish. And so this is one of those um, impacts that can have, you know, a real consequence, not only, you know, we are as ecologists are of course thinking about the biodiversity and the, um, the native ecology, but also how our community, you know, harvests scallops, for example. Um, we don't have, aren't, we don't have any concerning readings currently for Nantucket, but that's something that we are, and I say the big we are looking into, I know that um, Natural Resources Department um, has been collecting samples. But, um, you know, and then this is, well, not just increased carbon dioxide, but then it's exacerbated by warming temperatures of the ocean as well. Um, and so this is another impact that we're kind of looking into, and we can point to what's happening in the Gulf of Maine and say that that could definitely kind of be co coming towards our region. Next, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. So now we've talked a little bit, or quite a bit, Sarah's talked about what we're seeing regionally and, and on Nantucket as far as our changes in temperature and precipitation patterns, thinking about ocean warming. <clears throat> And so now we can talk about what some of those actual on the ground impacts look like on Nantucket. Um, I have some graphs here that are actually taken from the town of Nantucket's coastal resilience plan, um, which was uh, pu produced and published just a few years ago and which the town is using to help guide our island wide reactions and adaptations to climate change impacts that we know are coming. It's a really great resource and it's on the town's website. If you haven't seen it yet, I um, really encourage you to check it out. This map right here is looking at just flooding. And I know we know about sea level rise, but we're not talking about sea level rise yet. We're just talking about flooding, flooding that can come from just regular higher tide cycles, flooding that can come from precipitation and storm events that is putting water into our lower lying areas. And what this map is looking at is what is the chance that you get a hundred year storm coming into an area or the chance of um, a storm that you would see really over the 30 year mortgage of your home or a one in four chance within a hundred years. So the dark blue color is that these areas are most likely to experience one of these large storm events by 2030. That's the majority of the flooding if you see here Then if we're going into 2050 and 2100, we're getting a little bit farther flooding inland, but our island has some pretty low lying areas that will potentially experience some significant flooding really just in the next six to 10 years. And I say might experience, but we're seeing this already. Um, we're seeing impacts of flooding, particularly we see it in our downtown areas with storms. This figure is also from the CRP, but it looks at what gets impacted on the island in one of those 1% annual storms that's coming, one of those large storms that's coming. And in 2030, it's 80% of structures. This is island wide. 15% um, of roadway loss, service loss, which is pretty significant. You know, there are changes as we go, um, you know, up into 2050, 2070. Um, but 15% of roadway loss, if you look at those places that that happened, it's usually our connections out to Madiket or connections across Pulpus Road. Some pretty significant uh, infrastructure that's here on island. <clears throat> I had to put in some pictures of this increased storm flooding that I'm sure you've seen around social media. But just to really illustrate what the impacts of this kind of flooding are, this was a storm last winter that was pretty significant and there was enough flooding on Easy Street for uh, a canoe to move down pretty easily. Uh, this comes from the same storm that Sarah posted her last photo from, but this was from just a few weeks ago with flooding um, on Easy Street. And it you know, was storm related flooding with rain um, and higher tides that were coming in with some storm surge. But this is ending up being a pretty regular thing that we're seeing along Easy Street, flooding that looks like this. I can think of a number of days, even just in the past two weeks where I've gone down and seen things just starting to flood a little bit with a regular high tide that's coming in. Um, so we're starting to see water moving into areas and to our low-lying areas on Nantucket. So that's flooding that's coming from storm surges, increased precipitation in an island where we are, we need to add sea level rise on top of that. So I'm sure you've heard about it, but what is sea level rise? It's an increase in that average reach of the ocean, where tides are going, how far water is moving inland on a daily um in and out tidal cycle. 
And it's a natural process that has been, as many of these are, accelerated by climate change. <clears throat> we can average global sea level rise and look at it across the planet. Um, and globally, when we average sea, sea level rise happening in many locations around the world, it's getting higher every year. In 2020, global sea level rise was 3.6 inches higher than in 1993. Um, and it appears as when the data we're collecting so far that global sea level is increasing at about an eighth of an inch each year. We measure local sea level rise here on Nantucket. There's actually a local tide gauge that's out in Nantucket Harbor that measures sea level rise uh, or measures sea level and then is used to calculate how that sea level is changing and it's it's rising. It's, it's that change or rise or increase in what that average sea level is. It's influenced by your landform, how you're using land, erosion, currents. There's a lot that goes into how sea level is rising, but we are seeing it across Nantucket. This graph here is actually real data in the dashed lines of changes in local relative sea level, feet above mean sea level, up until this one was updated in 2022 with new data. And then the colored lines are projections. So how that sea level we're predicting is gonna change in the future. And if you think back to the beginning where I was talking about that 1.5 C, that change in temperature and how if we don't reach it, potentially we can change some of the impacts that we're seeing on island. That's what these different lines are. These different lines are what we call projections or scenarios based on how we as a world are mitigating our carbon outputs and how we're changing that global temperature. And if we reduce our impacts, we might likely see a smaller amount of sea level rise. The numbers over here, I know the graph is in meters, but the numbers are in feet um, to help make it relatable to, to numbers that you've probably heard. Um, so these are the scenarios that we're looking at between now and up to 2100 of change on the island. Uh, and it's possible that if we don't change a lot of our behaviors, this lovely old couple that's trying to visit the Whaling Museum who happens to go downtown at a regular high tide on a Saturday might have to wade through waist deep water in order to get there in a scenario that we're looking at without any adaptation. And so these are the things as we start to think about how do we adapt Nantucket for the future. It's thinking about how do we respond to increased water coming in with higher tides and increased precipitation water from flooding. <clears throat> so this map is also, again, from the CRP, and we saw the one of just flooding from storms. This is the high tide flood risk, and there are a lot of the same places. There are, there are a lot of those same low-lying areas where you're seeing those connections to the ocean and higher tides. One of the things I want to point out while you're looking at is that some of those areas that are expanding are actually not just right along a shoreline, but up some of our freshwater ponds or connected to Long Pond, which does have a connection to the ocean. Um, these are areas where we're going to see, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but changes in our freshwater ponds and areas due to changes in sea level rise that's coming in. Here is again that same graph of what we expect impacts to look like across the island. And I think this is a really powerful graph of the number of structures or the percentage of structures that will be impacted by sea level rise, by flooding from sea level rise in 2030, all the way up to 2100. Um, now, the thing to think about is this is sea level rise, average everyday high tide events. When you then add coastal storms and flooding from coastal storms on top of that, storm surge impacts, you're going to get more areas impacted than just these numbers here are showing. So this is separating out some of the impacts, but we know when you study ecology and you study natural systems, that these things compound onto each other. One impact is also going to influence another impact. So I mentioned our freshwater ponds. Rising sea level is also rising, raising, I should say, the level of our groundwater. And I have to apologize for having a graph of Cape Cod on here but it perfectly illustrates it, and we haven't yet drawn this graph for Nantucket, but our water systems are very similar. Um, so you have our mainland here. You can imagine this is the island of Nantucket. We have our freshwater aquifer underneath. Wherever that fresh groundwater intersects a lower area of our soil surface, you get a freshwater pond. You get one of our ponds, um, one of our wetland areas. 
And underneath all of that fresh water is our other saline groundwater. And towards our, the edges of our beach, our um, coastal edges is also our saline water. Salt water is denser than groundwater, so it sits underneath it. But as that saline water is rising, as those tides say along the shoreline are coming in a little bit higher, they're squeezing and pushing up that groundwater as well. So what does it mean when it pushes it up? It means that your areas of soil don't have to be as low to be wet anymore. So this area of this lake comes up and expands upward and outward as you're getting that groundwater being pushed up a little bit higher. So the water table is just how far down that fresh water is below your soil surface. And as that water table rises up, as it's higher than the soil surface, that's where you get ponds, wetlands, lakes. So what does that mean when it's rising? Over the next 30 to 50 years, we're expected to see a two foot rise in groundwater. And the impact of groundwater rising is predicted to be three times farther inland than rising seas. So if we look to this area of downtown that's on our map around Brown Brant Point, where we're seeing the flooding all of the time, um, we have an area that will flood because of sea level rise, but then three times further inland than that, we can expect to see changes in what's happening with our groundwater. The colors here that you can see, I know the graph is a little bit, um, a little bit small to read, but your darkest colors, your red to your dark orange, are all places where groundwater right now is between zero feet below soil surface. That's our ponds. So you know you're a, you're a wetland or you're a pond. Um, to the orange, the darker orange being, it's less than two feet below the soil surface. And if in the next thirty years groundwater is expected to rise two feet we can expect those areas that are currently ponds, wetlands, lakes to expand. We will actually end up having more wet areas around our island because groundwater is coming up higher. It's making that soil uh, wetter, shallower to the surface than we've seen before. And we're seeing it in places already. I, I love this example here. I've been out to this site um, many times and some of you probably have as well. This is along Easton Street. This is the circle just before you walk out to Brant Point. And in this first picture, the larger picture, we're standing looking across the circle down towards Easton Street. And if you go out and stand there today, you will notice that there's a slight, slight slope to the land. As you get closer to Easton Street, it gets, you're going a little bit, just a little bit downhill. When you go over to that other end, when you go over towards Easton Street, and I have that area circled in yellow here, this whole area has been a, a mown gra grass park for a long time, but this southwestern corner actually has freshwater plants growing in it. Not saltwater plants, but freshwater plants. Um, they're wetland plants, and they're plants that love to have their feet in fresh water all of the time. This means that we're not just getting occasional storms that are collecting water here and it's draining out. It means that for these plants to grow here in this spot, that soil has to be at least pretty moist with fresh water for greater than 75 days in the growing season in order to have wetland plants actually growing there. So what we're seeing over time is that the groundwater table there is rising so that it is now a moist freshwater wet area where these plants are happy and growing where they weren't there 16 years ago. So we're seeing a change in vegetation in this spot particularly and there's other places around the island that this is happening as well. Sea level rise is also going to change the rate of erosion. Um, and we apologize for this being an older figure, but it just perfectly shows what we're looking at around the island. The colored lines are high water shorelines around the island that have actually been measured off of aerial photos um, or you know old maps and digitization that's happened over the years to look at shoreline change and how our shorelines have changed. And you can tell by the arrows here, Red arrows are erosion. Gray arrows are actually where we're accumulating sediment around the island. There are actually places that grow on island. Um, and the size of the arrow is the intensity of it. So the bigger the area, the more erosion. The bigger the, the gray area, the more accumulation of sediment. As we get sea level rise coming in and we get bigger storms like we saw a couple weeks ago, we're going to see this rate, how quickly the, this erosion is happening on island happening faster. So it's going to impact that erosion change. 
Um, this is a map that you can actually see on the town GIS website if you want to, but it's a coastal erosion hazard map that FEMA put together for Nantucket a couple of years ago now. Um, and it looks at what we can expect for uh, erosion while taking into account sea level rise. So the colors that you see here, there's yellow, there's kind of a red, and then there's a purple after it. And for a lot of areas on the island and the areas we expect, we're getting some significant, but not, I shouldn't say not horrible erosion because in some places and for some people it is, but we're getting erosion within this yellow line. These are the uh, how far it's predicted that combining sea level rise and rates of erosion we have right now, how much impact we'll see on that shoreline. What gets really um, interesting is when you're combining sea level rise that's at some of its highest levels, things we could expect to see in 2100, how much erosion we could expect to see on the South Shore, how that'll end up impacting some of our ponds down here and access um, in Madigan. And what the impacts can look like when we're just looking at erosion. Um, it's interesting to see these numbers when we think about the number of structures that can be impacted by coastal erosion by 2030. You know, everyone that's on this call that has a connection to Nantucket knows how many structure, how much has been impacted by erosion just over the past few years, um, and that it's just coming to 1% might speak to the number of, of structures that we have on our shorelines. Um, but impacts as well to roadway loss and protected ocean. But as we're moving into those areas where sea level rise and erosion are combining as we reach 2100, we're getting some pretty significant impacts along our shoreline. And this year, we have already seen some pretty significant winter erosion. And I have the what used to be the front parking lot at Cisco Beach here um, on this side. And on the other side is what used to be even just a road around Madiket Beach access that's no longer uh, accessible uh, safely any longer. We had some significant erosion in the past few weeks that is changing the structure of our of our South Shore and is one of those. Um, climate change impacts that we're dealing with on island. And I think, oh, this is the last one I'm doing. <laughs> one of the other impacts that we're seeing, and I know we're throwing a lot of information at you. I should just pause and say there's a lot of information that we're sharing through this, but we're recording it. So you can go back, dig more into um, some of this data that we're giving you. And if you have questions that come up later, um, our contact information is in the presentation. You can always reach out to Sarah and I and ask questions or, you know, really um, anyone at many of our conservation organizations. We're all working on different parts of, of these issues. Um, one of the things that we've dealt with or been working on a lot in the past couple of years and get a lot of questions on because it's something that is new and we're really, we're really figuring out how this is connected to climate change and how we can predict what's happening are harmful algae blooms. These happen in our freshwater ponds. Um, so it's not necessarily a coastal thing. There's many communities that are dealing with this. That's just such a yummy yellow green color there. <laughs> um, cyanobacteria are blue green algae. They're microorganisms that exist within our freshwater ponds. Natural organism, something that is supposed to be there. But sometimes when we get these blooms where they have really large um, reproductive cycles and we get a lot of blue-green algae, um, as they're um, living their cyanobacteria life, they start to produce, um, can produce toxins that are harmful. One of the issues we run into is that you actually need to do lab tests to know whether a cyanobacteria is producing a harmful toxin or not a harmful toxin. So if you have followed some of our postings for seeing algae blooms around the island over the past couple of years, um, we post signs to warn people to be careful whether we know for sure it's toxic or not toxic. We post the blooms that we're seeing um, and they're not, they're toxic to people. They're particularly toxic to dogs and pets. And so we have a big encouragement that if you see anything like this, or you see a sign that I'll show you in a minute to not let your animals get into those ponds. The increase, we've been seeing an increase in these, in these algae blooms over the past number of years. And we believe through studies that other researchers are doing that it really is tied to climate change. It's tied to increases in temperature. So if you think about the past couple summers we've had, had on Nantucket, they're hot and they're dry. 
And what seems to happen is these hot, dry summers really increase the water temperature in the ponds. And then flushes of quick precipitation flush a lot of nutrients in the pond, which encourages these algae blooms to occur within the freshwater ponds. And we seem to get increases in these um, halves tied to that increased temperature and that flushing precipitation. Although once they start producing a hab, it often and some of the some of our pond stays for a majority of the summer. Um, these are the signs you can look for. There's a number of conservation groups that partner on monitoring our ponds throughout the season. Um, and we send people out to check most of the ponds that people go to and we try and put signs on most of the access points. They're usually yellow most of the year until we actually detect um, a harmful algae bloom or see signs of it, and then they switch to red. And that's when we really encourage you to not um, not let your dogs go in or for you to not go swimming. They all have QR codes so that if you're walking and see a sign and see something that looks like a harmful algae bloom, you can actually report that to the town and all the, that data is collated so we can keep track of what's happening with these algae blooms over time um, and correlate them back to water temperature and our studies of climate change. All right, Sarah, it is your turn to take over some of the depressing topics, although you have some really <laughs> fun ones that come up. There's some fun examples, I think. Thanks, Jen. I know we're. it's always hard to, it's really good and important information to pass along, but then sometimes you start to feel like we're the gloom and doom crew that we just tell everyone um, what's happening. But as Jen started at the very beginning saying like that it is change and we're trying to learn about the change, communicate about the change, and figure out how um, we can adapt. And I'm going to talk about um, some of the ways that we're already seeing aspects of climate change, how our flora and fauna are being impacted and changing, and just kind of what it is, you know, and how also how our different conservation groups are um, responding in different ways. Um, and then, you know, kind of the things that we're thinking about for the future. So with this figure, um, this one, once again, it's a little bit old, but I love these figures because it really um, speaks to what's happening with our climate. So if you look at the, you know, the image on the right that has um, Massachusetts, uh, so you can, the different um, colors are the different, once again, scenarios. So if we look at um, red is if we kind of keep using our higher emission standards and we're not kind of mitigating for the effects of um, uh, increase carbon dioxide as much, then um, over time, our climate is going to become closer and closer to a climate of what state is that? Um, oh, shoot. South Carolina. <laughs> South Carolina. Thank you. I was going to say the. I knew like if I just guess, I'm going to say it wrong. Um, so we're, you know, we're becoming more and more like the Carolinas um, that, that we know of now, you know, the Carolina of now. The South Carolina of now is what we're, we're kind of moving towards. And as we think about our changing climate, all those things we talked about with changing sea surface temperatures, air temperatures, precipitation events, you know, we look at, okay, what are the impacts that are going, where our flora and fauna are going to see? So some of the questions that I have on the left are questions that, um, that researchers are asking, that people ask, that people are investigating in different ways. So first of all, with different species, whether it's plants or animals, are their ranges shifting? Um, we're gonna you know, have some examples of that in a minute. So are they moving to either go to a cooler climate? Are they moving up? Sometimes, you know, on Nantucket species don't really have the option to move up, but in mountainous regions, um, sometimes species can move northward or they can move up. Um, in our example, if we're talking about marine species, they might be not only moving um, northward, they might be moving deeper and then deeper is often more to the east in some cases. Um, and as species move out of our region, maybe there were um, new introductions are coming into our region. Are there novel ecosystems, so new combinations of temperature and precipitation and habitat that we haven't seen before? And what are the seasonal changes? What are, um, you know, how are our phenologies changing the, you know, the timing of events? Um, and how will our ecosystems respond? Is it going to be very individualistic, right? You know, species by species, or will the communities as a whole um, respond and move in different ways? Um, and so these are all the kinds of things that we in different 
conservation groups, as land managers, as researchers, and as just as people living here, um, we think about all these things. Next, please. So um, I have a few examples of different climate change indicators and kind of want to relate that to Nantucket. Um, this is a figure that's looking at um, bird wintering ranges. So for the overall figure, it takes a um, number of different or 305 different um, bird species from North America um, and had a significant amount of data from between 1966 and 2013. And it looked at the distance moved north. So basically, as we're going from 1965 to 2015, we're looking at um, that number going up, that line going up is showing that the these birds, these 305 um, birds that were, you know, had, were studied, um, were moving northward or had a, their range was going further and further north. And basically the, these data are showing that the bird ranges are expanding northward. Um, and we're, this is linked to climate change and um, you know changing temperatures. We see this, I have the turkey vulture picture here. Many of you know who, if you know me, that turkey vultures are one of my favorite species, even though I'm a plant ecologist, I just love turkey vultures. Um, but when I was first here in Nantucket in the late 90s, early 2000s, turkey vultures were not seen very regularly. And in fact, I remember being on a bird walk and someone was saying, oh, there's some turkey vultures, let's go see them. They were like exciting to see. And that's just, you know, an anecdotal observation that is that reflects like is a story that, you know, kind of com is confirmed by the data that we're seeing. Because it wasn't, you know, a few decades later that turkey vultures not only became more and more common and resident and then resident birds. Now they're breeding birds here on Nantucket and very common and part of our ecosystem. It is something that not only the, the birds themselves have adapted to by expanding their range northward, but we have also just become accustomed to having the turkey vultures present on the landscape. Next, please. Um, and then similarly, we have you know these data from marine species. So these um, are three specific species. Um, so I'm more familiar with the American lobster and the black sea bass, so I'll focus on those. But these um, uh, the dots that are you know different colored are the uh, the American lobsters are that kind of like orangey reddish color. Um, and the green are the black sea bass. And the dot, each dot represents um, a centers of biomass. Um, so basically, I like the most um, fish were found in those areas. And as you go from the lighter color to the darker color, in this sense, it's moving through time. And so basically what this figure is showing is that all of these different species have been moving northward since 1973. Um, and, you know, I think these types of data are available for these species because they're commercially harvested species. And so I know from, you know, no, talking to fishermen, my husband is a fisherman, that the black sea bass has been a newer addition to our fishery here on Nantucket. Um, so in the past, you know, we, there weren't very many black sea bass. Um, they're bottom dwellers. So if you know where black sea bass hide in crevices, they're a really similar habitat to where lobsters are. So where lobsters here around Nantucket used to be found in the jetties and in the, in, you know, kind of in those, those bottom areas and kind of in cave, not caves, but in crevices, as those, as the lobsters move northward, um, the black sea bass have come in. It's not a specific exchange, but both species are moving northward. And so that's changing the fishery and changing the ecology. Next, please. <clears throat> And another big climate change indi indicator that we note here on Nantucket are new and invasive, more and new invasive species. And so I'm going to go through a couple of these examples. So um, as our climate changes, um, our climate might become more favorable to new species. So species that might not have been able to be to live here or to you know inhabit here year round or establish as a plant because our winters may have been just harsh enough. Now that we have milder and milder winters um, and our overall temperatures are warming, that Nantucket might be now more hospitable to some species. There's also um, I, what I, I like the term sleeper species. So these species that have been here on the landscape for quite some time um, that maybe did, weren't um, quite as aggressive or expansive um, and that now with a you know warmer 
uh, temperatures, a much longer growing season, now are able to um, expand that much further. So the example in this um, photo is the scotch broom plant. So scotch brooms were first planted here in the late 1800s. And only in the last, I'd say, 40 or 50 years have they really expanded in their um, not only their growth, but their reproduction. So they didn't really used to be able to reproduce very well here uh, because of the harsher winters. And now with our very mild winters um, and evergreen nature, Scotch Broom has kind of taken off along different bike paths and natural areas. And there's many examples of these types of species um, throughout the country. Um, we have new species like the spotted lanternfly on the bottom. I want everyone to kind of look at that very charismatic red with um, black and white spots um, uh, insect. This is a pest species that has been found for the first time this summer here on Nantucket through transport of you know landscape materials usually. Um, but these types of species, while we they have not you know caused a huge problem yet on Nantucket, species that are um, transported around and are now able to survive here. Uh, we have green European green crabs coming in in our marine systems that are quite competitive. And um, if you're interested in learning more about green crabs, both um, the Nantucket Conservation Foundation and the Nantucket Land and Water Council have been doing a lot of work with green crabs um, to help uh, kind of understand how they affect the ecosystem, but also try to help mitigate for their impacts. Um, the lionfish and the, uh, uh, what's the other bug? I'm just forgetting his name. Um, Asian longhorn beetle aren't yet here, but those are things that we're kind of on the watch for because they are kind of expanding into our areas. And the last thing I want to mention in terms of invasive species is a case many of you probably know is with um, the southern pine beetle. If you want to click the next slide, we have a specific slide about southern pine beetle. So this map on the on the left I have used in presentations before. This was well before Nantucket had an infestation of southern pine beetle. So like the infographic of the southern pine beetle actually covers the island. But it's really interesting to see how in such a short time um, the southern pine beetle has gone from like New Jersey and Long Island, expanded into Rhode Island and, and the Cape where um, uh, southern pine beetle has been trapped. So as its name states, the southern pine beetle is native to North America, but it has a, you know, a kind of typical um, insect of the southern Atlantic states and has really just been expanding northward with climate change and wreaking havoc on our pitch pine forests. And so we've known for the big we of Nantucket conservation people have known for a long time that this was kind of, they were detected on Nantucket, but there hadn't been an infestation. We were learning from, um, conservation professionals in Long Island. And this summer, um, the Nantucket Conservation Foundation had the infestation. Um, and you can see that photo that is um, on the lower right is where those number of dead trees were discovered in July, late July. Um, and so if you want to hit next, this is the sad picture. Um, so this is more recently, it's not a sad picture. It's a, you know, a response picture to help prevent the infestation from expanding to other pitch pine forest habitat. Um, so this was a kind of a, a, a rapid response that the Conservation Foundation was able to do, remove all the diseased trees and, surround, and some surrounding trees to prevent further infestation. You can find so much more about this at the Conservation Foundation website, and there's been lots of discussions recently. But I also wanted to specifically emphasize this as a drastic habitat um, alteration and change due to an insect that is has come here because of climate change. So these are, you know, not um, impacts that we're on the look for, at, look out for, or we're like thinking of ways that climate change might be impacting Nantucket. You know, we think so much about sea level rise um, and erosion here on the island, but there's many other direct impacts that are drastically changing our habitats. And this is one example that happened relatively or pretty rapidly um, um, here on Nantucket. And we think of how many more examples of this there are going to be. I don't mean to be so doom and gloom, but thinking about all of these as climate change impacts, when you think about, um, oops, um, you know, the other things that are happening on the island. Next. Can I, oh, sorry, can yeah, I jump? please. Just real quick with the, yeah. with the doom and gloom idea, but this is, as Sarah said, this was habitat change that happened because of 
climate change because our winters aren't cold enough now to kill off these beetles so they're able to have their reproductive cycles and spread but now it's adaptation. Now we need to look at this picture before you as an opportunity to learn about how we can help our ecosystems adapt to change like this. How can we do restoration? And then how can we do some of the work like what the land bank is doing to actually make our forests a little bit healthier on island? Because um, we have actually haven't done a lot of forest management on island. So now we're we're adapting some of our management tools because we've seen this climate change impact. Thanks, Jen. And I think that's a really important thing to remember is any type of restoration work or, you know, response work like this, where, you know, it doesn't look like aesthetically great right now because a number of trees were taken down. But this looks great to me because it's like, you know, we're removing that potential hazard of spreading um, the additional beetle outbreaks. But also this is this, you know, has an opportunity for restoration and restoration might not be right back to a pitch pine forest. In this case, it might be something else. I'm not going to speak for the Conservation Foundation, but um, it's kind of thinking as you go about the island and you go on walks and some of the different conservation areas um, are undergoing active management. Think about sometimes it's a response to something that's happened, but sometimes it's preparing for resiliency. Um, with there's like a lot of, as Jen said, with the land bank and, and ultimately the Conservation Foundation as well, doing forest thinning. Um, there's a lot of different um, uh, management and mitigation strategies that are getting prepared for this change or to help our communities be more resilient. Next, please. <laughs> um, the other aspect of our changing climate um, that I do a lot of work in is um, with our shifting phenologies. And so phenology is just the study of timing of when things happen. And what we're seeing is it's not just that um, our temperatures are warming, they are, you know, expanding the seasons in many ways. So this um, is a map that's produced by the National Phenology Network, which collects phenological data on lots and lots of different species, flora and fauna um, throughout the country. And they have been for many years. So they have a um, you know, long-term average for, let's say, leaf out, and um, which is this map is spring leaf out, which is basically like when is spring arriving to an area. Um, this map is from 2022 and just shows the um, leaf index anomaly. So just like a lot of our other maps, the red are when things are happening, in this case, a lot earlier, which means like warming springtime temperatures have happened up to 20 days earlier in this particular year. And the bluer temperatures means that things have happened later than the typical, you know, 20 year average. Um, and this is just one year, but I want to uh, um, snapshot this because it shows that also it's not uniform across our country, right? So we know that in this particular year, you know, as parts of the mid Atlantic and South Coast had, you know, kind of later than normal springs, but in, we know in New England and Nantucket specifically, and in Southern Maine, we had um, a much earlier spring. And um, we're collecting a lot of those data here on Nantucket, if you wanna hit next. Um, at the Linda Laurie Nature Foundation, some of our um, bigger research projects are about looking at um, indicators of climate change with phenology. So we have a, um, we've been looking at a lot of our native um, shrubs, looking at flowering and fruiting and when things leaf out. Um, we're also looking at hatch of caterpillars. In some cases, people collect data on caterpillar or on um, insect pests to understand when, you know, a pest might be arriving. Um, but a, what we're seeing generally, um, and this is not just our research, but more broadly, is because the springtime temperatures are happening earlier and earlier, things are leafing out earlier. And that has different consequences for different species, and it's very species specific. Um, the other thing that we see is that growing seasons are longer. So it's not just that something happens early, that also fall comes quite late. So um, it's really interesting both how our native species are responding to that and our invasive species are responding to that. And that can have big effects on how we manage the, our habitats. And I'll just mention really briefly because I have the tree swallows on here. Um, we also are monitoring our tree swallow nest boxes and looking at, um, you know, while, while we're, our major goals of management um, are about supporting these migratory bird species and their breeding habitats, what we're finding is one of the reasons that they're in decline is because, um, they're changing phenologies, they're changing their timing. And when they're, um, you know, if they're nesting earlier and earlier, then they could, their um, 
their eggs may be subject to kind of colder temperatures. And so that's not just work that we're doing, we're, we're monitoring as part of a bigger whole, but it's really interesting to look at how the different species are, are responding to these shifting um, temperatures. Next, please. And phenology isn't just about plants and the things on land. We look at, um, people look at, you know, the timing of fish arrival, migratory fish species that affects our commercial and recreational industry. Um, I don't know how many people on here um, obsessively look at on the water striper migration map every year. I know Jen's husband does every year. <laughs> we do. When are the stripers coming? Um, it's kind of an event, right? Um, if you want to hit next. Um, we also think about as not only the timing of when things happen, is it earlier, but as I mentioned with um, plants it's the and the growing season, it's the duration. So there's research that has shown, this is from Rhode Island, that um, cold water species, they are declining in their in their residence time because they prefer the cold water. So they're around for much shorter periods, while those warm water species are increasing their summer, their summer residence time is increasing. So it's not just when they arrive, but how long they're here too. And that can really affect, you know, ecologically the migratory fish species and um, what they're eating and what's eating them, but then also the recreational and commercial fisheries as well. Next, please. And then as I mentioned, you know, I study um, common native shrubs like blueberry, like our low bush blueberries, but then there's also culturally significant plants. So, you know, daffodils aren't native to Nantucket, but they, we, with our daffodil festival, they're obviously a cultural and economically important species um, that the timing of the daffodil festival, um, you know, there's been discussions about, are the daffodils gonna still be around? Have they bloomed too early? Um, we've had some discussions with the Nantucket Garden Club, they have, or the, um, the daffodil and the, specifically the daffodil festival organizers, they have distributed like late blooming bulb varieties um, to ensure that there are some daffodils available dur during daffodil season. So we're already adjusting our behaviors to some of these shifting climatic um, aspects of climate change that we didn't even maybe think about. Um, next, please. Um, Jen already mentioned harmful algal blooms, but there's also, you know, plankton or um, uh, phytoplankton in the ocean that um, has blooms as well. And the timing and the duration of those has changed. And so that also affects what's eating them. And so there can be bigger, um, grander effects for the um, phenology of algal blooms um, in the ocean as well. Next, I think there's one more. Um, and then to throw in a bird example, our oyster catchers, um, you know, oyster catchers have been a highly migratory species that have been studied and, you know, banded for decades here. And we're finding that there are more and more oyster catchers here in the winter. So are those going to be the next turkey vultures who are now going to be here? Are they residence birds? Are they going to be start, you know, they have been migratory and breeding in the winter or in the summer rather, but um, now we're seeing them more frequently in the winter. Um, so there's more research going into looking at them. Fortunately, many of the oyster catchers have been banded. So there's, um, and with uh, field readable IDs, so there's more um, to be done or it's more, it's a lot easier to kind of track them that way. Um, and so some of the, a lot of this work is just in progress where without um, direct experimentation, we're just kind of recording as things are happening um, to help us investigate patterns um, on a local scale and hopefully share data with people um, so we can see what's happening at a regional scale. Next, I think there's only a few more. And so this just leads to, you know, some of the work that we've alluded to both in, you know, Jen and I, about what are we doing about this? <laughs> um, what are our land trust organizations doing, our conservation groups? And we put together, this is by no means a complete list. It's just some of the things that we thought about um, not just Nantucket Conservation Foundation and the Linda Loring Nature F Foundation, but these are some of the things that we're doing. Um, so we're researching and recording the effects of climate change where we see them. It's important to collect as much data as we can, whether it's the um, recording of scientific data or anecdotal observations that are going to be important in the future. Um, we are conserve, continuing to conserve our threatened species and habitats as um, a mandate of many of our land trust organizations. Protection of biodiversity. We know that more biodiverse areas are more resilient to change. And so the 
better we can protect those areas, um, the more resilient our habitats will be. Um, while we can't change everything, like we can't necessarily stop erosion and increasing temperatures, we can reduce other threats. So other um, invasive species maybe, or um, other direct impacts and overuse um, or misuse of our properties um, that kind of further put stress on these environments. Um, how can we make them more resilient? And then our land as mitigation space. So a lot of our lands, you know, those maps that Jen was showing where there was um, both the sea level rise impacts and storm surge, um, a lot of that land is owned by different land trust organizations. And maybe some of our role is as mitigation space and taking on water, um, doing a lot of these um, mitigation projects to help protect the surrounding infrastructure. I think that's a big role that a lot of our organizations play. Education and outreach, like events like today, um, and walks that we do out on our different um, vulnerable areas to showcase some of the um, changing um, impacts. Um, and then helping create a more resilient community. And that means not just the land, the flora and the fauna, but our community as a whole. We are all here and we all want to be resilient together. You wanna hit next? I think this is the last one. Um, and you know, there's so much work going on by so many different organizations. Once again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is a representation of organizations um, that are all within the Nanteca Biodiversity Initiative as well, where we all work individually and collectively um, on a lot of these things, whether it's phenology, the green crab work, coastal resilience and salt marsh restoration, the southern pine beetle work, where which um, the Conservation Foundation and the Land Bank have really been spearheading, we're all learning from. Windswept bog restoration is like, I feel like that one sentence alone doesn't encompass all the work that um, has been going on to that. Um, harmful algal bloom monitoring that we're all involved in, in invasive species removal, management of wildfire, um, postal resiliency plan, and early detection and rapid response for new invasives. Um, and all the permitting that goes on behind all these topics. So. I think I just want to, you know, give a shout out to all the organizations that work together and we learn from each other too, as we try to um, work through all these impacts. Next, please. I think there's like one last one. Yeah. So we want to thank everyone who was here today. Um, if you didn't join us in the very beginning, I just want to reiterate, um, if you're interested in sharing some of the impacts that you've seen or observations you've had about um, climate change around the island, you can click on that QR code um, and that will take you to the Climate Change um, Summit website, which has a questionnaire, um, which, you know, just is a few questions um, just as an opportunity for you to kind of plug something in about what you're seeing around the island. Um, I will say that when we shared this information at the Climate Change Summit in September, uh, we had lots of great information and kind of um, historic observations about when people were younger and how it's different now. Those were so such valuable stories. We also had a report of a spotted lanternfly, um, which was really interesting. And um, so I really wish I could have followed up with that person, but they didn't actually put any contact info. So if you have, you don't have to put your contact info, but we'd always love to hear from you um, mm -hmm. about your impact. So I think we have um, some time for some questions if people have questions or, or um, yeah, so if you have questions for us that we can answer um, right now, you can either put them in the Q&A or you can put them in the chat. Um, if you want to write down or copy our contact information on here, if you think of anything later, um, excuse me. And I know that uh, we do, we are recording this, as we have said before, and we'll be sharing the recording with everyone. So if you want to watch it later, come up with additional questions, you, you of course, can email us. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are thinking about questions you might have. I want to say that the other part of this week's uh, Climate Change Summit Winter Edition event is that Sarah and I are leading a walk this Friday out along Folgers Marsh um, at the UMass Boston Field Station. And there is still room in it. I think that registration is closed on the link. But if you want to join us, please either email myself or Sarah to ask and we'll be able to add you to the list and make sure you have the timing and directions down. And I will say just for that walk, the weather looks pretty decent for Friday. So um, <laughs> and now that I said that, I'm going to jinx us, but 
Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to look through the chat really quick. Um, thank you. People are saying nice things. <laughs> um, um, we do have the chat, the question and the uh, question and answer in the Q&A, Sarah, about whether the presentation will be mm -hmm. distributed or available. And I know we said it at the beginning, but uh, we are recording this and it will be um, emailed out to everyone who registered uh, and is here. And then we'll also have it available on both of our organizations, YouTubes and on uh, our website. So it, it will get out and we hope that you uh, share it to anyone that you think might be interested. There was, thank you, Jen. There was one question um, about the interest in, you know, sometimes our slides had Celsius and so there's a few times it was Fahrenheit. And of course, with, with our American audience, we're much more used to Fahrenheit. Um, I think if you do watch the recording, they're, they're, they do go back and forth it's because, you know, we're kind of beholden to the research that's available to us to use. Um, one thing I can say is that, you know, we, we, talked in the beginning about that 1.5 degrees Celsius being the, like, we don't want to go to reach that. What was it? 2033 is that most updated when we get to 1.5? No, November, 2023. Mm -hmm. So 1.5 Celsius in that way translates to about 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. It's, it's a rough like translation, yeah. but that's one I can, I, I know, but I think in terms of the other figures, um, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll kind of think about that for next time. Um, another question was, are you, are your, your, our organizations as well as other island conservation organizations um, collaborating with the CONCOM for updated regulations? Do you want to? Sure. That's a really, really good um, question. Uh, the CONCOM is currently working on updating their regulations. And one of the big things that one of, one of the big pieces of it, since it's been a while since the local regulations were updated is adding in climate change and coastal resilience pieces to it to help facilitate um, adapting to climate change, but also looking at changing some of the things that might have been permissible in the past, but thinking about um, what we now know is, is coming with climate change. Um, so that is, that is happening on a local level, and you've probably heard some of the review associated with that. As far as the really the the work of permitting that most of our organizations go through ends up happening more at the state um, and the federal level. That's where uh, a lot of the excess and overlapping regulations are happening. And there are um, some groups that are working at the state level that are advocating for ways to make that permitting process more efficient and more effective, especially if you're looking at some kind of adaptation response as opposed to you know, an impact or a, um, a development building. But if you're looking at, you know, how do I do a project to help make my salt marsh more resilient? These groups are start to, starting to try to figure out how we can streamline some of those processes and still have them fit under, um, <laughs> excuse me, our regulations. Um, okay, so just to answer a few of these in order, I guess, is um, there is an interest in, um, uh, a present if there were any presentations or discussions about the built environment, especially downtown with historic buildings, um, there has you know Jen and I are ecologists and so we focus on the natural environment. But yes, there has been a lot of discussions um, about the downtown infrastructures. I think the Preservation Institute of Nantucket has done a lot of that work and present and has presentations um, associated with that. Holly Bacchus and the town has done the um, building with historic Nantucket in mind that has, is that, I'm kind of- I think you got it, yes. <laughs> that document that has a lot about um, climate change impacts and working with historic structures. So there, there is a lot of information. Uh, it's just not my personal area of expertise. Um, let's see. We've had a question that says, um, wondering about the presentation tonight, not just the recorded presentation, but whether or not our slide materials will be available. We have put our previous presentations like this on our the ac climate summit.org.com. I'd have to look again. We'll email it out to you. We've put it on the website that we've created for the Nantucket Climate Change Summit. And so we'll, we can put this one on there as well, along with the recording. So it will be in one location. And when we 
email this out to you guys. Um, I know we've had some requests for some updates on some of the links from the mm -hmm. presentation. We can include that website presentation or that website link in there as well. So you can get all this information in one place. Um, Kristen, if you're still here, can you put the in the chat the link to the Climate Change Please. Summit website? I appreciate that. Oh, Mary just put it in for us. Thank awesome. you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, <laughs> If you are registered for the talk tonight, you are not automatically res registered for the walk. So you do have to do that separately, but you can um, email one of us and we can confirm that you are or are not registered. I know some people may have registered a while ago. So um, yes, PowerPoint. Um, thank you. People are saying these things. Sorry, I'm reading through. <laughs> mm. um, so this, this is a really great question um, from Andrew that says thank you for this um, presentation um, and wanting to know or saying that one of the most important things an individual can do to combat climate change, how do we get that hope ourselves, is to vote and have your vote be important, which certainly I agree with that. But what other impactful things can individuals do in order to help decrease negative effects of climate change on Nantucket? And that's a really great question, Andrew, and really gets at the how can how can you make a difference? How can I make a difference um, day to day? Um, and Sarah and I both probably have ideas on this. There's obviously how are you impacting broader climate change? How are you being more sustainable? Um, focusing on your personal impacts and the impacts of, you know, where your home is, where your office is, how you do your shopping, voting with your how you're spending um, your your money, uh, where you're buying things, and what that looks like. Uh, that is all. Those are all ways that you can help on that bigger climate change piece. But I think I know for me and for a lot of other people, it's how can I do something that feels really, really impactful right now? And it's you can look at how do you, if you own your own home, can you switch to any kind of alternative energy sources? Can you incorporate solar into your um, into your home or? if you have influence at the business that you're at. Adapting your landscaping to be native vegetation is actually something that's really helpful locally on a local scale for climate change. Um, plants that don't need as much water, that don't need fertilizer, that are adapted to living and thriving here on Nantucket. Um, thinking about those changes to your, to your landscaping that would then also help support a lot of these native species that we want to keep here and promote being on island. Sarah, what, what do you have to add to that? <laughs> yeah, I, I think Jen, you had such a good um, beginning of that list. And the other things I think about are, um, you know, supporting the local conservation organizations. And I'm not saying that like from a development perspective, like um, it's more like when you see an organization closing a trail for maintenance because they are doing something, that is a positive. I think sometimes, you know, people are, you know, Understand, understandably bummed out if they can't go to their favorite walk spots and and things like that. And so um, supporting all the work that the conservation groups are doing because many of us are working in that, you know, towards resiliency, I think is a, is a really important way to think about that. Um, I think, of, you know, thinking about that fertilizer piece, um, you know, as Jen was saying with the different um, species or yeah, you know, planting, native where possible, but like low water consumption and, and you know, the, the limited need for fertilizer, if any. Um, we know that a lot of the harmful algal blooms, for example, are exacerbated by fertilizer runoff. Um, and so those are kind of relatively small things that people can do on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think that, uh, you know, individually rethinking about how we, you know, our consumption and our driving habits and that kind of thing um, are easy, are, you know, kind of small changes, but I think small changes lead to bigger mental changes of how we think about a lot of these things. Um, and just re being flexible. I think, you know, things are not going to stay the same. We are, no matter what kind of projects we have and, um, you know, all these innovative designs for dealing with water and working towards climate change, it's still not going to be like the same as it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I think all of us have an opportunity to weigh in in different ways on what that solutions that we choose as a community are and the direction of our community goes. Um, but I think being flexible is a, another important thing locally. Mm -hmm. 
And kind of connected to this discussion, there's a question in the Q&A about how, how can we get involved and help? Are there volunteer opportunities and internships? And, and that's kind of a two-parter, but connected to that, how do you get involved? And I really think it, part of it is coming to things like this and learning, learning what's going mm -hmm. on around your island and making sure that you're educated in what is in the language of what is happening. So you can also communicate to your friends and your neighbors about what you're learning in a positive way. Um, we do, the island does have a coastal resilience advisory committee that meets publicly that's talking about how Nantucket is adapting. Those are great meetings to go to if there's something, especially if there's something that you want to bring up or you want to know what's happening, but also encourage that committee and the town, the public, you know, your public representatives to focus on particular issues. I think that's a great way to get involved. Each of our conservation groups have volunteer opportunities and internships. They're all a little bit different, um, but if those are things that you're interested in being connected to, uh, you know, and again, there's there's other nonprofits on island that are dealing with, say, our um, historic buildings that how do we are adapting those to climate change? There's lots of places that you can go to help see how you can contribute your time to answering some of these questions. We do have to wrap up, but I want to just also mention that um, Campbell says Matt just had the first crocus up in his yard and it's February, you guys. <laughs> <It is not. laughs> I can't handle a crocus right now. Um, but that, okay, I will say that is an important piece of data and phenolo phenological observation. Please take a picture and either put it on iNaturalist or you can send it to me and I will do that. But that's a discussion mm -hmm. for another day. But it is an important piece of data. Um, Very important. The last thing, um, Jacob asked a really great question about, are, is there a figure somewhere that combines all those things that we talked about? Like the maps that we showed of erosion, groundwater rise, um, sea level rise, you know, storm surge impacts. Um, that would be great. And yeah, in theory, you could just like overlay them all together and have those areas of impact. And that is one way. But what we don't have is we needed an, a specific analysis of how those things interact with each other. And at a small scale, I think that's more possible, but um, it hasn't been done for the island yet. That's a Not yet. <laughs> complicating factor. Um Okay, so before we do sign off, I do want to mention not just the walk um, this Friday, but next March, we have the round two um, of our Climate Change Summit Winter Edition. I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head, but you'll see a whole bunch of things about our <laughs> March date. It's in our calendars on our on our on both of our websites for our organizations. Um, it is not going to be just a repeat of this. We're going to talk about um, coastal ecology and how our different habitats form and kind of lead a little bit into the green infrastructure that um, can, you know, benefit our habitats. Is that about right, Jen? That sounds great. Yeah, some, it'll be mid-March. So we'll get us a few weeks into March before we, we come back here again. But thank you all so much for showing up on your, your Wednesday evening and spending your time with us and for participating in the chat and questions as well. We, we really appreciate your, your involvement in this. Thanks so much.